we're very glad that you're here with us. And we know that you're here to help us to accomplish the show's two objectives. First, to glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And secondly, to encourage each other in the Lord. That means that if you're having a good day, we want to, want to ask you to help us to encourage someone else. And if you're having a bad day, we're here to encourage you in the Lord. God loves us so much that not even heaven will separate us from him. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. We're here to give you good news. We're here to share only the good news with you. The good news that Jesus Christ is the creator of this entire world. Jesus Christ is the one who sustains life. Jesus Christ is the one who died on Calvary Cross to restore us when we fell into sin and sin equal death. Yes, so our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ died to redeem us. And the Bible said in John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3, Jesus said, I go on to prepare a place. And because I am gone to prepare a place for you, I will come and to receive you unto myself. And so the Christian journey, not only does God come within us and give us contentment and calm even amidst the storms of our life, but he also gone to prepare a place for us that where he is, he will take us soon. Where we no longer will live in this sin-sick world where so many people are dying from coronavirus, so many people are dying from cancer, so many people are dying from different illnesses. Our oh, Lord and Savior Jesus Christ even going to put an end to death. Even an end to death. So we look forward for when our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will come and remove us from this sinful world. But until then, God wants to give you inner peace even now. And so why don't you just bow your head with me while I ask God, the Holy Spirit, uh, to direct us going forward. God, God of heaven and earth, a new day with a new opportunity to worship you. We're here to worship you because you are awesome. You are awesome, God, and we're just here to worship you. But Father, we also know that we worship you best by encouraging each other in you. So we're here also to encourage each other. So if there's someone who's having a bad day, remind them, oh God, that you love them. Put words in our mouth so when we speak, you may be words of hope that will encourage them, strengthen them in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let us bow our heads in a moment of, of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings. We thank you for ministering to us uh, today. You have provided, you have protected, you have sustained, and you have led us. But most important of all, you have placed within our hearts a desire to learn to know of your divine will for our lives. We pray that you will bless every listener this evening with an attentive heart and mind. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The scripture reading is found in the book of Revelation. and I'm going to read it in your hearing. It is Revelation chapter 13, verse 4, and verses 12 through 14. Revelation 13, verse 4 says, Amen. And they worshipped the dragon which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verses 12 through 13. 14 says, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on earth in the sight of men. Verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which had the wound by the sword and did live. All right, so we're going to take a pause here. And uh, I am sure that 
many of those listening and those who perhaps have read this passage are quite fascinated. It sounds like a script from a Star Wars movie. And many people are fascinated, many Bible commentators and other uh, theologians are fascinated and intrigued with the description, the narrative description given by John the Revelator with regards to uh, this particular um, creature. And um, according to prophetic uh, interpretation, we know that it is all symbolic. It's not literal, not literal, a literal creature, but it is symbolic. It represents earthly powers. It represents the political um, systems that exist and how they exercise their power on earth and how those powers conflict with the word of God and the prophecies relating to the end time. So it is quite interesting. It is a quite fascinating, uh, eye-opening uh, study every time you engaged in the prophecies of Revelation. And there is a corresponding prophetic book in the Bible that is the one known as Daniel, which correlates with Revelation. And so therefore, in the interest of time, uh, I just want to make this quick observation, very, very important point to consider. That is, whenever you are studying one prophetic book, you have to analyze it and use the other prophetic books as parallel to give insights into the study of the prophecy. So this is very, very, it's a, it's a, it's a standard procedure for any serious Bible student that you always have to compare prophecy with prophecy and um, history with history, uh, gospel with gospel, you have to juxtapose and put them together so that it will, uh, one will interpret the other because it is important that we do not place within the Bible our own interpretation or inject our own ideas but to allow the Bible to speak to us and to tell us exactly what it means. So the sermon um, title or the message of discourse for this evening is, we still believe, we still believe. <laughs> Quite an interesting topic. National church and national religion, an attraction to modernity. That's the theme. National church and national religion, an attraction to modernity. A quick look at the history of the Christian church will be essential for this presentation this evening. And uh, when we look back in history, we look back at the events that, uh, that happened, that occurred years gone by, it gives us a better understanding as to where we are today. And perhaps give us the key to better understand what is about to happen. What is about to happen. So when Christ established the Christian church, it was founded on himself. Jesus was the founder. He was the foundation. He presented himself as the stone, the chief cornerstone that, that no human being could have planted. But he says clearly that he is that foundation. And there are biblical scriptures to back this up, to support this. A lot of people alluded to Peter as being that stone, but Peter was not the stone. The foundation of the church was Jesus Christ. So when the disciples came together following the day of Pentecost, uh, they came to give their support to the, the promise that Christ made to them. They came to demonstrate their faith and their reliance on Christ's direction, protection, and provision of purpose for salvation. That's very important. They promised to follow the script, to follow the instructions that Christ had given them. I think this is what we today ought to do. We are to follow the same, follow the same trend in the footsteps of the disciples. Listen to the words of the one who founded the church the founder of Christianity, Christ Jesus. But what happened after the, the disciples died? 
By the turn of the first century, following the death of the disciples, the influence of worldliness, paganism, spiritualism, and nationalism corroded and corrupt the Christian church. And as a result, the challenged, the challenging effect, what happens to the Christian church created a serious problem. The changing of the color went from white to gray to purple, red, and then black. This is described as the four apocalyptic horse, horses in the book of Revelation. But in the interest of time, once again, I will just mention as we go along with the study. An important question that needs to be asked is this. Did the Christian church, did the church conquer the world with the gospel? Or did the world conquer the church with pagan practices? I think that's a very salient question, very important question that we need to ask or any serious Bible student need to ask. And I'm going to challenge you as you ponder on this question to re revisit the idea, the concept that uh, what is happening today with the Christian church is something that was predicted through the prophecies of Revelation. So as we ponder on this question, someone said one time, if only the early church had remained pure and true to Christ, then uh, the Roman Empire would not have corrupted it with pagan influences and practices. That is, if the early Christian church had remained pure and true to Christ, the Roman Empire would not have corrupted it with pagan influences and practices. And when we talk about the Roman Empire, we're talking about the ancient Roman Empire, not modern Romanism, but the ancient one. Uh, in light of knowing that it was ancient Rome that was in existence during the time of Christ and the apostles. We know that Jesus Christ was, uh, he was crucified uh, on the Roman authority. Pontius Pilate was the Roman uh, um, judge uh, who was there at the time and who said, I find no fault in Jesus. Roman soldiers were guarded, were the ones who, who implemented the crucifixion. Uh, and so we have evidence, both scriptural as well as historical evidence to prove that the Roman Empire at the time of Christ was pagan Rome and later on changed from pagan to papal. Just as John predicted the colorization, the transformation of the Roman Empire from a pagan state to a papal state. Very important because we see as history progresses, uh, there was a transformation a, um, and that transformation created a change within the system. We're going to revisit this in a while. So there is another question that we need to ask. Suppose the Christian church had continued to practice faith, not fear, truth, not tradition, trust in the divine, in divine power, not mistrust in divine teaching. Then, according to the prophet Amos, righteousness would have flowed like a river and peace like a mighty stream. Do you believe that? You believe, my friends, that if the early church, the early apostolic church had continued to practice faith, not fear, truth, not tradition, trust in divine power, not mistrust in divine teachings, then the words of the prophet Amos would have come to fruition. And that is righteousness would have flowed like a river and peace like a mighty stream. All right, now, as you ponder this, I know what has gone through my mind, but I want to reassure you, to assure you rather, that whatever the word of God predicts, whatever the word of God says, even though it may not have been fulfilled, but because it is the word of God, because it is built on a sure foundation, you can rest assured that what is predicted will surely come to pass. So when biblical truth, when biblical truth is laid aside, then doctrinal, what happens is when biblical truth is laid aside, then doctrinal purity and unity of faith in divine leadership amongst believers breaks down. 
this was the reason why pagan practices invaded the early Christian church. What was left of the early church? The imperial Roman Empire trampled over it to pieces. So in other words, because the early church did not continue in the unity of faith, doctrinal purity, and the pure teachings of Jesus Christ, it created an inroad for the, for the, for, for the practices of uh, paganism to come into the church. And as a result, it corrupted the early church. The Christian church then adopted pagan practices and the pagan and the pagans on the other hand adopted a corrupt version of christianity so while they they switch roles uh, both of both got contaminated christianity the christian church got adopted pagan practices it got contaminated with pagan rituals and then the uh, the, uh and then the pagan now the pagan pagans adopted some version of christianity which was not pure History records this, my friends. But let us continue with this narrative. In light of what the word of God teaches, warning fractions must be seen as a diabolic manifestation of the time of the end. Why this is important for us to, uh, to emphasize, it is because Jesus had given them the warning, had given us rather the warning, the world had been foretold that because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. And then the apostle Paul picks up on what Jesus said, and the apostle Paul says that there will be a falling away, a falling away. In other words, the church will not remain pure. The church will compromise. And as a result of the compromising of the church and its principles and the truth of the word of God, then it corrupted the early Christian church. This, my dear friends, is a diabolic manifestation of the time of the end. Now, let me share this with you. These are historical facts I need to share with you. In the Middle Ages, in the Middle Ages, England and France, supposedly Christian nations, fought the Hundred Year War 13, from 1337 to 1453. Central Europe, supposedly Christian, separated into 10 jealous little states, symbolized by the 10 toes in the feet of clay and iron in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, bubonic plague, the black death struck in the 1340s and rescue and reoccurred repeatedly for centuries, killing millions that the wars didn't get. In the Christian West, the three evil horsemen found plenty to keep them busy. Now, these are commentaries written about the Middle Ages and during the time of Christianity uh, during the Middle Ages. What happened within Christianity, not only was there a corruption, but a corrosion, both uh, economically, politically, and spiritually. Now, as a result, Jesus had already foretold and forewarned us in Matthew chapter 24. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus says that there will be pestilences, there will be all kinds of environmental changes, there will be corruption, mor moral corruption, spiritual corruption. And as a result of those corruption that will take place in the earth, it will precipitate and bring about all kinds of diseases and conditions that would plague the world. Not only were there fractions and divisions among separate states uh, through, down through the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was divided into 10 states, just like the 10, 10, sto 10 toes in the image of Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream. He saw an image and the feet was of iron mixed with clay down to the 10 toes. So we find that when the Roman Empire shift or move from pagan to people, there were a disintegration and a diminutive or the in terms of political power 
because of those warring fractions, okay? And on top of that, on top of the split, the political divisions, there were bubonic plagues uh, such as the Black Death that struck in the 1340s and recurred and reoccurred repeatedly for centuries, killing millions that the wars did not get. So what we are experiencing today in terms of the global pandemic, COVID-19, is not something that is new to this earth. There have been many in times past, particularly those that have been recorded in history, circular history, that reminds us that we are living in very tragic times. So now we see that most perplexing, the Christian church itself became a principal cause of warfare, famine, and desolation. Protestants versus Catholic fought the devastating 30-year war, 1618 to 1648. The church drove the Huguenots out of France. Political and economic demands of bishops and priests led directly to the stark terror of the French Revolution. See? So all of those uh, historical chronicles, uh, details, gives us a broader understanding as to the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. So let us now look at the rise of nationalism. Created What created um, nationalism? What, what was the causation? What was the reason behind the rise of nationalism? The rise of nationalism created the rise of national churches. There is a correlation. There is a correlation, my friends, with the rise of nationalism and the rise of national churches. We're going to see how this plays out. Whenever Christians put their country first, guess who comes second? Whenever Christian put their, put, Christians put their country first, guess who comes second? Christ. Yes. And this should never be. Christ must always be first for the Christian. But whenever Christians put their country or anything else first, then obviously Christ will be placed on the back burner. Christ will come second. And that's one of the uh, causes for the rise of nationalism. Fought principally by self Christian nations. Do you know that? Yes, World War I was fought principally by self-styled Christian nations. So World War I was another reason for the rise of nationalism. Then we had uh, the Lutherans in Germany, Anglicans in Britain, Orthodox in Russia, Catholics in Italy and France, and then Protestants in America. What they had in common, Lutherans in Germany, Anglicans in Britain, Orthodox in Russia, Catholics in Italy and France, Protestants in America. What do they all have in common? What they had in common was that they want to make their country a Christian nation. They wanted to make their country a Christian nation. And so because Lutherans wanted Lutheranism to be the national religion of Germany, Anglicans wanted Anglicanism to be the national religion of Britain, Orthodox in Russia wanted Orthodox to be the national religion in Russia, Catholics, the same thing in Italy, Protestant wanted America to be a Christian nation, a Protestant nation. And it is weaved in the American constitution. It is part of the American doctrine. It is something that's why when we see today the rise of, uh, of white nationalism, we see the rise of um, what we call evangelicalism in America, it is something that we must pay close attention to. Now, we are told that the way the great controversy started and plays out, the beginning of religious wars, is the way it will end. Let me repeat. The way the great controversy started and plays out, the beginning of religious wars, is the very same way it will end. In fact, 
the Bible record says that in heaven there was war between the angels against angels against angels. On earth, we have had Cain versus Abel, Jacob versus Esau, Isaac versus Ishmael, Jews versus Gentiles, Catholics versus Islam, Hinduism versus Buddhism, and Christians versus non-Christians. If you take your time and look at all the underlining sentiments between warring fractions and nations that disagree with each other, you will find that every war, every um, conflict centers on religion, centers on religion. And even within Christianity, we find that there is those factions. So now you understand how the, this plays out in light of biblical prophecy, because in Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, verse 40, 42, all the way to 44, Daniel's prophecy says that there will be a division toward the end of the, of the Nebuchadnezzar's image. And that division will be like, it is likened to a division between iron and clay. Iron and clay cannot mix together because they are not of the same product. They are not of the same element. Iron cannot mix with clay. One is strong, one is weak. Uh, likewise, likewise, symbolically, symbolically, this tells us that the condition of both religious and the political systems of these last days, these the times in which we live in, will be similar to the disunity that exists and the disagreement that exists uh, between uh, Christians and, and denominational or religious entities and political entities, just like the iron cannot mix with clay. So the word of God, my dear friends, is speaking to us. And the question is, do we still believe the word of God? Do we still believe what the word of God says is true? And look at national religion and national economy in light of Revelation 12 verse 13. And 13. Because remember what Revelation 13 um, says, verse 5, when, we, when I read it, it says, that global political entity will come under the guise of a religious entity or will assume a religious role and even will influence worship. It will invoke as well as influence worship among the population of the earth, among the peoples of the earth. And also uh, economics will play a key role because we are told that no man will buy nor sell. So that is trading, it involves trading. Trading, it involves the commerce, you see. And uh, the underlining factor that comes with that is what people professed to believe in. Uh -huh. What people professed to believe in. Now, when we look at the rise of American nationalism. The rise of American nationalism purports that America should be first. And you have heard this over and over again. It is ringing like a, an alarm clock on the political stage. America first, America first, America first. And do you know that this has some serious repercussions, you know, when people begin to advocate and say America first, America first, which means that everybody else must come second. Everybody else must take their um, secondary uh, position. So America's American super superiority and America's supremacy is uh, part of the political ringtone. And um, also we find that um, in terms of economy, buy American products, America first. But there is a conflict uh, of sort uh, that goes on the global market. And that conflict has to do with how America is, um, is standing up to China, uh -huh, to Russia, and to the rest of the world. 
You see, while on the surface, my friend, it appears to be a good strategy for America. It appears to be uh, something that is needed in terms of maintaining the economy of the United States of America, but the spill-off is uh, that must be that the question that must be con be asked and we must consider is how America American superiority on the global market will affect her citizens and how it will impact on faith and religion. I think this is a good question to ask. So when we talk about the rise of American nationalism, it will also give rise to a national religion. And remember, when America was founded, it was founded on religious principles. Protestant is America is considered as a Protestant nation. And you could see how this is being played out on the political stage. So now we go back to Revelation chapter 13, which says that the image of the beast will be likewise be a persecuting union of church and state, a religious system wedded into a national government and empowered by it to suppress residents who choose not to abide by her principles. In other words, those who oppose the popular views will be oppressed and most likely suppressed. But in order for this to happen, there must be a shift from democracy to totalitarianism or autocracy. <laughs> Is that possible at all? Is that possible? Have you watched the trend lately? Have you watched how the politicians are speaking? Have you observed lately how the fermentation and the rise of nationalism and religious extremism is now blending together and they are speaking the same language? Hmm, something to think about. Let me say that um, it is quite possible in view of America's wonderful constitution and the marvelous record of the lamb-like liberty, we are compelled to wonder if it is really possible for this country to follow the old world pattern of dictatorship by way of persecuting religious minorities? Hmm. So my friends, while you are thinking and while this is playing out in your mind, let me say that the word of God, while some people may not want to believe the word of God and may be hesitant to accept what the Bible says and what the scriptures teaches, but it worth it to reconsider, to reconsider. And then we are not here to make any fanciful declaration or to take on a fanatical high, high, high road and try to uh, uh, make us, make, 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 make prediction, make us sound as though we know everything. That, no, 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 no. That's, that's not our purpose. That's not our objective. Our objective is to present Christ Jesus. And you have heard over and over on this platform, Jesus Christ, his word, his teachings, his promise of soon return. And that's where we stand. But while we are waiting, while we are preparing for Christ's soon coming, we need to be aware of what is taking place and what is happening in our world around us. Bible prophecy. Bible prophecy, my friend, is the key to the future. Examples in the Old Testament, specifically Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, you could write those passages down. Daniel 7, 25, and Revelation 13, which I read one or two verses, 11 through 17, is 
paramount. And those passages are packed with information that unlocks the political and religious fervor and developments of our present day and time. So write those passages down. Daniel 7, 25, Revelation 13, 11 through 17. And you, you will observe that there is a pattern. You will observe that there is a coming together of church and state, of the rise of nationalism and, um, and, 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 um, and the national, national church and the national religion and national um, faith that would make one wonder. It will make you wonder whether the beast symbolically represented as a world power refers to the United States of America in Revelation chapter 13. You have to draw that conclusion for yourself. I'm not going to tell you because I want you to develop the curiosity. But let us look at something here to help us grasp the prophecy. Let us look at a few unhappy developments in America's past. A few unhappy developments in America's past. And it is part of Satan's crafty master plan, by the way. In order for the devil to carry out his plans and schemes to infiltrate Christianity with false interpretation and so forth of the prophecies of Daniel, what is happening today? The master plan is to carry out this scheme, to carry this scheme, is designed to attack Christ's messiahship role on earth and in heaven as high priest and intercessor. It is to replace with the belief to establish Satan's kingdom on earth, the kingdom of modern day um, Jerusalem, purported by John Nelson Derby and other leading Protestant churches in America, known as dispensationalism. Now, I know this is a little heavy to absorb and to unpack, uh, for, especially for those of you who are listening to this for the first time. But, you know, just, just, just ride with me. Just ride with me. Here is how his plan has been played out. Satan uses futurist, futurist Jesuits interpretation of Daniel 9.25. Remember that text, Daniel 9.25. To show that the change in God's law was not done by the papacy and that damage was done by an infidel name, Antiochus Epiphanes. Therefore, the Antichrist is in the distant past. Now, the reason why we are sharing this information with you it is because the Bible predicts that there will be a falling away. There will be a man of sin. There will be an antichrist. And that antichrist, that falling away, that man of sin, is what Daniel chapter 13, I mean, um, Revelation chapter 13 is talking about, and what Daniel chapter 9 verse 25 predicted. So this is why at the beginning of the, of the presentation, I mentioned that we have to take prophet, prophecy with prophecy and particularly Daniel and Revelation, and have them to interface, interlock, and to inter, in, uh, interpret the other so that we have a clearer understanding of where we are today in the grand scheme of things. So in order to, in order to take away the attention of the damage that the papacy have done after pagan Rome came papal Rome, so the damage that was done by papal Rome on the law of God, the law of God by changing the law of God, uh, so-called uh, historicist, historicist interpretation of Daniel's prophecy points that damage to a Greek leader known as Antiochus Epiphanes. And they said that that damage was done by this man in the distant past, or therefore it does not refer to the papacy. So therefore, that prophetic fulfillment is in the past. It's a way to deflect. It's a way 
to turn away our attention from the real issue that is at stake. So while the world today is in comatose, while the world today is asleep, and when we talk about the world, we talk about the, the, the religious world, is asleep and not paying attention to those masterful prophecy, prophecies, they are, the devil is working out his plan to, to disrupt and to displace the prophecy, the word of God. So the use of dispensationalist interpretation of the prophecies of the Old Testament is being turned over to establish modern day Jerusalem as the capital of Christianity. And it has already been done. It has already been done under the leadership of President Trump. You know what happened? Jerusalem is now the capital of Israel. And so therefore, quote unquote, evangelical Americanism has now gained reputation by influencing the thought, the religious thought, that somehow the interpretation of the Old Testament prophecies is now directed in the direction of making Israel the center, modern day Israel, and Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem, the capital, not only of Israel, but of Christianity as a whole. All right. So a look at the resurgence of anti-Semitism now, what is known to as McCarthyism, and neo-Nazism in America tells what time it is. Because once there is a, an upsurge of one thing, there will be a counter attack. So when, once we see the upsurge of making um, Jerusalem the center and Judaism the, the centerpiece of, of the Christian world, then there will be an anti-movement, anti-Semitism, anti-McCarthyism and neo-Nazism in America is also on the rise. Have you observed this lately? Hmm, something to think about. And those upsurge of ideas or ideologies is fermenting under the, under the Bill of Rights. And it was done, the Bill of Rights was done against Mormons. It was done against Mormons in the 1880s. The Japanese Americans during World War II, they put the Japanese in concentration camps. Uh huh. Why? Because whenever there is an upsurge of war, there is a rise of, of one movement, it creates panic and fear uh, among others. And the, 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 the way they try to resolve that is by evoking uh, the Bill of Rights and therefore trying to quash or to shut down or to intimidate or to keep in place other groups so that American nationalism or any other isms will prevail based upon the voice of the majority. So in the name of a more perfect union and the common defense, it compelled elementary school children to salute the American flag, even if it stand against religious conviction of Jehovah's Witnesses it prohibited them to do so just like they are doing today in condemning sports players for not standing during the singing of the national anthem. Hmm. I know this is a lot for you to digest this evening, but let me continue. Ride along with me. During the same time, World War II, 70,000 Japanese Americans born in the United States, loyal to the flag, were suddenly placed in concentration camps or relocation centers as they were called. All these were legal and justified by the Supreme Court under the name of common defense. Remember, the, the Supreme Court supported that. So we are not all that safe in terms of thinking, well, because we live in a democratic country and that we are living in a time where freedom of speech, freedom of religion should be exercised. 
But let me tell you, that could be taken away from you at any time. The same interpretation came after 9-11. The same interpretation came after 9-11, created homeland security. And today, the separation of parents from their children under the name of emigration reform, where they separate children from the family on the border in Mexico and uh, um, other southern states, brings to the same idea, the same ideology. History has shown that nationalism and national religion be, uh, be breeds, it breeds hatred. History has shown us that nationalism and national religion breeds hatred. America's past history is tainted with racial and religious hatred. Sad to say, my friends, a country that champions freedom has already engaged in acts of persecution. Remember what Revelation 13 says, that they will neither buy nor sell. They will exercise, verse 12 says, and he exercised all the power of the first beast before him and caused the earth and them that dwell upon to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. And he so have great wonders so that he make a fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men and that whosoever on earth did not comply according to those would, would be uh, persecuted. All right? They competed genocide against Indians, calling them savages, standing in the way of civilization and progress, known as expansionism, from sea to shining sea. They practiced the worst type of slavery against black people from Africa. She has even used her matchless Bill of Rights as an instrument of oppression in the famous court case known, uh, famous court case 1857, known as the Dred Scott decision. For example, the United States Supreme Court solemnly sanctioned slavery and formally affirmed that under the constitution, no Negro would be a citizen of the United States. So we are not talking about something that is new here. We are talking about something that history have recorded. So because those things have occurred in the past, should we not be suspicious or at least be concerned about the trend that we are seeing right now? Let me further say that the court interpreted the Fifth Amendment, which protects life, liberty, or property, so as to make it protect a slaveholder's right, ownership of the Negro, and claim that the slave is his property and therefore has no rights under the same constitution. So now in 1908, the Supreme Court in the name of the constitution endorsed the right of American states to shut down a private Christian college for no other reason than that it would welcome descendants of slaves, Negroes as faculty and students. And so that gave rise from 1908 injunction of the Supreme Court rise to the segregation laws known as Jim Crow, uh, the segregation. And today what we are looking at is a resurgence, a resurgence of nationalism. And it is coming on the fascism, fascism and uh, neo-Nazism. And so now we are seeing now how angry white nationalism has become and they had support from a former president. And also we find that the over 200 of the United States senators are silent and quiet and refuse to condemn the upsurge and the uprising of white supremacy. And so now we begin to see where we are in light of Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13 talk about that lamb-like beast that speak like a dragon, has the appearance of a lamb, but when it opened its mouth to speak, it exercised the power of the first beast, which was pagan Rome, as predicted in Revelation chapter 13, verse 12, which I read as our scripture reading earlier on today. So the first beast, pagan Rome, became religious, turned into papal, a mixture of Christianity and worldly politics, church and state. That's what happened in the past. We are seeing the same thing today. It should not be a surprise that white evangelical and 80% of white America are strongly supporting where America is going against immigrants because it is a threat to, um, to the white establishment. And so therefore they are against 
the policies to integrate other people of color into. So that's why you find even with the voter suppression and the voter laws of 47 states, 47 states in the United States of America, as I speak, 47 today have an, enacted laws that um, make it more difficult to vote in terms, and they use the term uh, reforming the voting policies, but there is an underlining reason behind it. Revelation 13 verse 12 says will, that she will exercise all the power of the first beast before him Another way to look at dictatorship, my friends, is to see how the executive branch of the government is undermining democracy. In other words, to call free speech the enemy of the people. If you disagree with his views, ideas, and policies and support the results of fair election, then you should be fired. This is the nature of dictatorship. So therefore now, uh, freedom of expression is suppressed freedom of religion will follow suit. Freedom of worship will follow after. Revelation 13 verse 17 says, no man might buy or sell. This is economic sanction in plain view. This means that when economy is doing great, everyone will agree on policies that are on the surface appear to protect the national economy. This will lead our attention to the next verse in Revelation 13, which is making fire to come down from heaven in the sight of men, Revelation 13, verse 13. And so in order to force other nations to comply with the legal agenda, she possesses economic sanctions, poses economic sanctions on trade and manufactured goods and raw materials. Hello, my name is Pastor Owen Barnaby, President of Final Shout Television and Social Media Network. Final Shout's objective is to join hands and hearts with our fellow men, holy angels, and God himself in sharing God's redemptive love with the entire world, that Jesus is the creator of the world, the sustainer of the world, the Redeemer of the world, and that Jesus has promised us he will come back to receive us unto himself. Please join our mission in reaching two billion people with God's redemptive love in three ways, with your time, your giftedness, and your resource. First, with your time. Watch and share Final Shout 24-7 anywhere in the world on the following platforms. Final Shout on Ruka TV. Final Shout on Fire TV. Final Shout TV on Apple TV. Social media such as Facebook or Meta. YouTube, Twitter. Download or Android and Apple phone apps. Or you can watch us 24-7 on our website. Watch.fanashout.org Second, with your giftedness. Become Fana Shout's show producer, director, contributor, host, hostess, or you can tell us of your giftedness and how you would like to serve. Third, with your resource. Support Final Shout financially. Become Final Shout's 12 Stars Club member, which help with our monthly operations budget. Two, become a sponsor of a show or sponsor a series of shows. Both individuals and businesses can be sponsors. And three, choose our merchandise. Thank you in advance for your prayerful consideration in joining our mission in reaching two billion people 
with God's redemptive love. As the joy of the Lord is final shouts strength. Wallace Muffler, our motto, you bring it, we fix it. Wallace Muffler's services, here at Wallace Muffler, we offer a wide range of services and repairs. With over 37 years of experience that you can trust and count on for all your vehicle's health needs. We practice proactive car, health maintenance and prompt repair service. Specializing in mufflers, brakes and any mechanical issue. You bring it, we fix it. Services we offer are air and cabin filter, air conditioning, battery, body and trim, brake service and repair, brakes, check engine light and diagnostic, electrical, exhaust, oil change, steering and suspension, transmission, and tires. Here at Wallace Muffler, we promise 100% customer satisfaction guaranteed. Same day service for most repairs. Work is done right the first time. Call us here at Wallace Muffler for an appointment at 203 850-3253 or visit us at 379 Walton Street, Hamden, Connecticut 06517. See you there. Taj Realty, make your dreams a reality. Taj Real Estate LLC is a full service firm specializing in commercial and residential properties, short sale, sale and marketing of existing homes, condos and rentals, FHA 203K sales, and first time home buyers, investor purchase and mortgage. We offer mortgages for investors and commercial clients. Non-owner occupant, no income, self-employed, low income. Let us guide you to the neighborhood that's a fit for you. If you're looking for a starter, a first time home, a cottage, a vacation home, colonial, a city comfort, Suburban, a hidden tranquility. Luxury, a lifestyle. Chateau, a modern French style. Even a waterfront beauty. Or, if you're interested in commercial investments, a strip mall shopping center. Hotel, city high-rise, storefront, commercial shop space, office space, business place. Whether it's commercial or residential, whether you're looking for a mortgage, buying, selling or renting, Taj is just a call away. Do you have a question? Come in person and experience our full service at 630 Dixwell Avenue, New Haven, Connecticut 06511 or visit us on the web tajrealestatellc.com. A call away. Call today. Call 203 691 one three eight five